Hello. Is this on? Hello. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Manchester School of Architecture and our Inspirations Lecture Programme. My name is Professor Kevin Singh. I'm head of Manchester School of Architecture. And just going to talk about the running order uh, for tonight's amazing event. So first of all, thank you to University of Manchester uh, for the space. We got the biggest space that we could get. It's a 600-seater auditorium. But apparently, we had 1,600 people who would like to come tonight. Uh, and the tickets sold out, sold, they were free, don't worry, uh, within one hour. Um, so um, just in a moment, I'm going to introduce Professor Colette Fagan, who's the Vice President of Research at University of Manchester, and then Professor Stephen Hodder of Manchester School of Architecture um, will give her perhaps a, an architectural and a personal introduction to Lord Foster. Um, we're slightly tight for time, um, so we will try and do a Q&A at the end, um, but we're going to have to play that a little bit by ear um, because there's a very specific departure time. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Colette, but thank you for coming, everybody, and I really hope you enjoy the occasion. Hello everyone, it's my great pleasure to introduce Lord Norman Foster to deliver tonight's lecture. Norman was born in Greater Manchester and graduated from the University of Manchester in 1961. On graduating, he won a Henry Fellowship to Yale's University School of Architecture where he completed his master's degree. Subsequently, he's been awarded honorary degrees from a number of prestigious universities, including the University of Manchester, in recognition of his outstanding career and contribution to architecture. Norman is the founder and executive chairman of Foster and Partners, a global studio for architecture, urbanism and design rooted in sustainability. His projects include many, the Reichstag in Berlin, the Great Court of the British Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, airports in Hong Kong and Beijing, headquarter buildings for Hearst in New York, Apple in Cupertino, Bloomberg in London, Comcast, Philadelphia, and the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank in Hong Kong. His current research projects include, and this one is really fascinating, association with the European Space Agency and NASA to explore solutions for the creation of habitations on the Moon and Mars. He is president of the Norman Foster Foundation, which is based in Madrid with a global reach, and this promotes interdisciplinary thinking and research to help new generations of architects, designers, and urbanists anticipate the future. In 1999, he became the 21st Pritzker Architecture Prize Laureate, and in 1997, he was appointed to the Order of Merit in the UK, and in 1999, was granted a life peerage in the Queen's Birthday Honours List, taking the title of Lord Foster of Thames Bank. And while doing all this, Norman maintains passions outside work, which is good for all of us, and his include cross-country skiing, cycling, and aviation. Thank you, Norman. Um, Sir Norman, um, everyone, uh, can I add my welcome to you all to this very uh, special lecture? Um, in the late 1970s, uh, there was an exhibition of work by Foster Associates at the Whitworth Art Gallery, which included illustrations of the recently completed Sainsbury Centre for the Visual Arts at the University of East Anglia. This young architectural student struggled to understand the building. How was it able to contain both a gallery and a university department in a single space? A gallery without walls with seemingly no hierarchy in the circulation pattern, architecture that was assembled rather than built. I, I had to visit. Descending the spiral staircase with alternating views of Lasden's residential uh, student residences and woodland, via the glazed ends, I was transfixed by the majesty of this remarkable light-filled space. 
its structure extending beyond the building, blurring interior and exterior, and how one felt completely immersed among the artifacts in the gallery despite its vastness. It was a truly enlightening experience for me, and I spent my first two years in practice designing Silver Shared, seeking to emulate the unattainable. Of course, what followed was the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, a building which challenged the orthodoxy of workplace design, Stansted Airport, a threshold in aviation design, the Reichstag, which dared to question the interface between government and its citizens, aside from being an eloquent essay in conservation. Sterling Prize winning buildings, 30 St. Myers Acts, and the more recent Bloomberg building, which pushed the boundaries of sustainable office design. And I could go on and on, but each I have visited, and each has been inspirational in their social and technological underpinnings. Alex Gordon, a previous RIBA president, coined the phrase, long life, loose fit, and low energy. And the work of Sir Norman and that of Foster and Partners is the absolute embodiment of this approach to synthesizing architecture. Whilst at the RIBA, um, we held an exhibition in conjunction with the BBC entitled The Brits Who Built the Modern World, which told the story of an exceptional generation of architects that extended their influence worldwide. And it occurred to me that not only has Sir Norman's work inspired so many, such as myself, but elevated the profile of British architecture immeasurably. And I'd like you now to join me in welcoming Sir Norman Foster. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be back in this amazing city. I've taken the title literally. Um, inspirations is very closely linked to influences. And we're a product of our experience, whether that's subconscious or conscious. And I think that trying to weave together uh, influences um, uh, inspirations uh, is a risky business because one can play post-rationalizations. You can, in a way, reinvent. You can reimagine. And um, so I've, uh, I've taken that risk. And um, it also perhaps enables, as designers, those sources, conscious or unconscious, um, to create uh, the phenomena of innovation in design. And so um, all of these influences kind of weave together. And this is a diagram that goes back 40 years to 1983 when I received the gold medal and I tried to explain an approach to design which was taking the analogy of threads. And one of those threads um, you won't read the fine print, but it says influences. And um, so I've tried to, in my mind, separate that out as very simply people, places, and objects. And examples abound. I mean, people, it could be parents, collaborators, mentors, um, uh, teachers, places, can be cities, can be a a space, a piazza, it might even be a hotel, um, and objects. Uh, objects could be locomotives, could be aircraft, could be works of art. And, um, and for me, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by the different aspects. I don't see a compartmentation between these different worlds. So uh, I would identify with Winston Churchill when he says, uh, we shape our buildings and they shape us. And a very personal example is, for me, Manchester Town Hall. Uh, I left school when I was 16 and I discovered architecture in this masterpiece, the outcome of a competition, 1877, Alfred Waterhouse. And I can, to this day, remember the detailing, the extraordinary, uh, as if the building was carved out of stone. And I didn't know the meaning of architecture. I probably didn't even connect 
that experience um, at that young age of 16. And, and I would make excursions at lunchtime, and I would discover buildings like the Owen Williams 1939 Daily Express building, and the arcades, Barton Arcade, Lancaster Arcade, the latter no longer uh, with us, sadly, um, wasn't prized at the time. And this, these contrasting forms of, of architecture excited me. Um, and, um, and I can still identify with those same buildings today. Uh, the lightness of the cast iron tracery of the 19th century, uh, the solidity of the town hall, um, the futuristic rounded corners, sleek skin of, of the Daily Express building. I was in Manchester Town Hall City Treasurers as a kind of office boy, clerk, accountant um, for two years. And then I was called up for military service in the RAF. I elected for the RAF um, and uh, spent most of two years in a kind of uh, bunker of a... There's no image there. That's interesting. There should be a, um, a hangar. Uh, grass covered, but um, I was a radar technician. I worked on um, on a system called G3, which um, it was a new electronic age, and um, and would enable the new generation of jets, the Vulcan bombers, and the and the jets afterwards um, to keep track of navigation. So this was a new world of um, of electronics. And when I came out of uh, military service. Uh, I didn't want to go back to the town hall. I survived for about a year doing all kinds of uh, menial tasks, manual work. Um, and, um, and this building, my local library in Levenshulme, uh, again shaped my future. I had access, I discovered books like Towards a New Architecture by Le Corbusier, I was excited by the juxtaposition of a Caproni hydroplane with the Acropolis in Athens. I discovered through Henry Russell Hitchcock, who was, I was to meet later in America, uh, the world of Frank Lloyd Wright. So that eventually led me to Manchester University. Um, in between, I was excited by something that I saw on the way in today, and this was dramatic today as it was in my kind of teenage past, and that's the Jodrell Bank Telescope, the way that it hovers above, uh, above nature. And um, I would escape the urbanism of Manchester uh, for the nature of Cheshire and Derbyshire. Another influence at that time was uh, Lowry. And, um, and I've been privileged to be able to, well, actually, my wife gave me a birthday present of a Lowry painting, which is interestingly, 1935. But I was, um, I was drawn to the kind of gritty urbanity that Lowry uh, would portray of the kind of industrial north. And, um, and in putting a portfolio together for an interview at the School of Architecture here in Manchester, I was inspired by, by Lowry and um, really like to pay tribute to somebody who uh, was, although I only met him once, and that was at the interview. I never met him afterwards. And that was Professor Cordingly. And, um, and he realized, I mean, everybody said, why would you apply to a university when you left school at 16 and you don't have the qualifications for a degree? But I did so anyway. And, um, and interestingly, this man, this professor, uh, recognized that there was no way I could get a degree. And instead, he created something called a diploma. And he said, you'll get the same piece of paper, you'll do the same five years, um, but you'll get a diploma at the end of it. But it was a kind of catch-22, because normally to get the grant that would enable me to study, um, uh, I, would, I went to the education authorities, and they said, well, it's great that you've got in university, but you don't have the qualifications for a degree, so we can't give you a grant. Uh, so it was a kind of catch-22. But, um, but anyway, I worked my way through university for most of the time. And, um, 
And the very first design project was for two buildings um, in the Lake District. And one was a boathouse on the water, and the other was the, the cottage where the couple, the family, uh, would stay. And um, I challenged that and instead did one building, one building for the family who would stay with a glass wall and the boat, which would be a loving object, probably like the Caproni hydroplane that I saw in towards a new architecture, kind of Ferrari of the water. And, um, and that as, this is the, that drawing watercolored for my first design exercise here in Manchester. And that principle of reducing and celebrating the single building, fusing the different experiences, unifying them, is something that has persisted uh, as a passion, as, a, as an objective uh, over decades since then. So there is a certain continuity, and if one talks about influences, then uh, I've become very aware that my experience as a student here at Manchester and also at Yale has informed uh, that professional uh, future. So an example of dissolving the separate buildings uh, and in a way reinventing through that process. And here, uh, a first building, the last building of, uh, of a practice called Team Four, which I'll talk about shortly, um, under one roof brings together with a glass wall just separating, just like that little house, uh, separating the management uh, from the, those who are assembling the electronic uh, components. So that was really totally challenging. The we and they, the posh and scruffy, the back and front, and instead creating a democratic pavilion. And here at the University of Anglia in the Sainsbury Center, seeking to do the same thing, to dissolve the boundaries between those who are teaching a history of art and those who are enjoying the extraordinary works of art in the collection of uh, Sir Robert and Lady Sainsbury. Uh, and here we can see uh, that, the, that mix of activities, whether that's a restaurant, a school of, uh, of, of history of art, uh, or a main gallery, and, and connected to nature and the, and the landscape. We seem to have lost, ah oh no, we haven't, excuse me. Um, in the third year of the course, uh, there was an exercise called the measured drawing. And, um, and the measured drawing was always of a work of architecture, which was considered a, a Georgian terrace, a Georgian building. And I challenged that and Instead, uh, I had a, an emerging interest in the, what is now called the vernacular. Architects without architecture, as Bernard Rudolsku would later refer to it in an epic catalog and exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, but I was totally unaware of that. I just loved the an, an anonymous uh, uh, buildings. And, um, and the idea was that you did measured notes, you can see on the screen on the, on the right there, uh, and you would do that on site, and then you would construct the, uh, the traditional plan sections and elevation. I chose windmills, barns, and, um, and interestingly, I again broke with tradition and tried to show how that barn was made three-dimensionally. And without question, as I look back, that was informed by a very important periodical of the time called the Eagle. And it would do cut through sections of, the, uh, of things like locomotives, which excited me at that time. And it was also uh, predicting the future. So it was kind of science fiction in a way. And, um, and this image on the right is the airport of the future with the atomic-powered aircraft. And it's interesting that at some point between that time and now, 
something happened where the future was no longer better. The reality is that the future is better, and the reality is that everything is better now than it was then. But at some point, I always assumed that the future would be better, and I still do. But somehow that perception has changed, and it's become a more dark, foreboding, sort of threatening point. Um, I show this uh, because um, the, my ultimate, perhaps, answer to the risk that I took by choosing not to do a measured drawing of something that was considered by the school as architecture, and the barn and the windmill were not considered honorable architecture in that sense. But the reality was that I won a huge amount of cash with an RIBA prize for that measured drawing. And, um, and so that was the answer to, uh, to any of the doubts that might have been raised in the marking process subsequently. And, um, and uh, so I would, ritualistically, I won prizes from the Manchester Society of Architects, Walper Muir, um, and, um, and so my summers were usually, I was working in a cold store earning money for the fees for the next year, and then I would receive a prize, often a cash prize, and that would enable me to explore Italy, Scandinavia, I saw works of Jorn Utzen before he won the, uh, the Sydney Opera House competition, and, um, and again, I realized that I, I was all the time challenging convention. For me, I was fascinated by public spaces in the city, uh, which I've subsequently described as the urban glue, the infrastructure of public spaces, which joins the individual buildings together and determines the DNA and the lifeblood of a city. And I analyzed uh, on one, uh, one summer vacation uh, a whole range of public uh, spaces. And that, um, uh, as an interest, uh, resonates through uh, today and, uh, and perhaps um, informs why I'm as fascinated by the infrastructure, uh, acting perhaps as an urbanist, uh, notwithstanding the fact that I'm passionately driven by the design of the individual buildings. And I show one example, which is Trafalgar Square. It's very easy to, um, to forget how that was uh, before its eventual transformation, the closing of the road to the north of Trafalgar Square. And here you can see a member of the team who was active on that, dodging the traffic. And you can see how pedestrians were held in a, in, in, in a pen. And the transformative effect of closing that that road to the, to the north, which sounds very easy. It only took seven years to achieve. Um, and uh, that is how it was before. That is how it is now. And if I was standing at the church at the end of that vista and looking back towards this, this is how it would have been uh, before, and this is how it is uh, uh, today. That, um, just to quantify some of those changes, the pedestrian movement in the area increased by a factor of 13, took half the time to walk across. Congestion, it also occurred at the same time as the introduction of congestion charging, 30% reduction and quantifiable decrease in carbon dioxide, and adding something like 122 million every year towards improving the, uh, the public transport in the city. Coming back to Manchester and my final year, and in a way, um, I realize that if one's talking about influences and inspirations, it becomes to a degree sequential, autobiographical. And, um, and I just uh, perhaps here um, seek to explain uh, the influences, the inspirations behind my final project in, in, in Manchester. And that was really a combination of those two uh, architectures, the architect of architecture of Alvar Alto, very, very much earth brown, earthbound, and the tracery, the lightweight uh, architecture of the, of the future, the industrialized uh, uh, post 
the great exhibition of 1851, and here uh, they, they come together. At that point, as you've heard, I was awarded a Henry Fellowship that took me to America, and, and again, um, I did something which was rather unusual. Students habitually, the only way they would go on a big line of transatlantic, it would take a week. I worked till the absolute last possible moment, and I got the equivalent of what was then the budget airline, which was Icelandic Airways. And for 100 pounds, I was able to cross the Atlantic. 100 pounds at that point was really serious money. I mean, in the 50s, you could buy a house for 500 pounds. So um, it, was, uh, it was really a, a big deal. And that took me to, um, to Yale, to the School of Architecture, which was temporarily held, the master's class, um, on the top floor of Kahn's uh, School of uh, Kahn's uh, Yale uh, Art Gallery. And um, so the, the, the school was temporarily there. And, um, and this is a sort of glimpse of those spaces, extraordinary building by, again, uh, an architect who is a, a very, very powerful uh, influence. Um, Lou Kahn, and here you see Lou Kahn looking up at the, the ceiling. And um, I thought it was worth just a reminder about how uh, all architects are influenced by, by other architects. And Kahn was no exception. He's looking up there at that ceiling. That ceiling could not have happened without Buckminster Fuller and his triangulation, his geodesic uh, design. And, um, and at Yale, there were three individuals who, again, shaped my future and the kind of architecture that, with colleagues, uh, we would produce together. Um, at, the, uh, at the right, there's Vin Scully, who brought history alive uh, in a way that I'd never seen history before, because he would relate what was happening today to what was happening in the past. So it was a live subject. Then in the middle, you have Serge Shemaev, who was the ultimate European, uh, the intellectual who would come by your board, and wasn't really interested in the drawings, wanted to talk about the philosophy. Was it really the right thing to do to design that building? And then, of course, you've got Rudolf. And Rudolf is the all-American star architect. And if you haven't got a model or a drawing, there's absolutely nothing to talk about. It's a highly competitive uh, environment, and, um, and I have to say, I loved it. I, I, I really thrived on it. Um, uh, this is a model of one of many projects at that time, but I single it out um, because Bob Stern, who was subsequently the Dean of Architecture at Yale and was an undergraduate at the time that I was a postgraduate, um, uh, went public and said, uh, this project of Norman determined the Hong Kong Bank. And, um, and I've sought to perhaps explain how that might be, because um, this is the, you can see in the center, the plan, and it is totally the opposite of a high-rise building, in that there is no central core. It's a series of loft-like spaces, and in true Khan fashion, uh, the, those elements which serve that, uh, the heating, the ventilating, it's in between uh, those, um, those, those spaces. And um, this was also an important turning point uh, for me because uh, everybody went to the books of, uh, of high-rise buildings and saw that it was a central core, a space around it, and I asked Rudolph, I said, I've never done a, I don't know how to look at a high-rise building. I need an engineer. That was travesty to Rudolph, because for Rudolph, the architect was the supremo, and you only went to an engineer when you designed the building, and the engineer made it stand up, made it hot or, or, or cold. I was challenging that. And, and again, that was another turning point, the influence of working with an engineer creatively. Um, and I felt through that process, which has again informed uh, the future in terms of the practice as it is now again over many decades, it's multidisciplinary, uh, but that had its roots very much in the, in the Yale experience. And here you can see uh, the equivalent plan in the Hong Kong Bank, 
There's no central core as there traditionally is, and every high-rise building up to this building always had a central core. So the idea of pulling those to one side also enabled this building to not be demolished in its lifetime, but it's responded by being able, with the open loft spaces, uh, to incorporate a, a dealer's floor, unheard of in a traditional uh, high-rise uh, building. And here you can see uh, the building from the outside, uh, the, uh, the banking hall, and if one thinks about other influences, um, then my travels in the United States at that time, on the left-hand side here, you can see the vertical assembly building, Cape Canaveral, uh, extraordinary space. And looking back, there are all kinds of similarities. Coming back to that studio in the Khan building, and um, there you can see that I'm next to, to Richard. We formed a friendship. Again, we challenged the system. We did something that never been done before. Uh, we did a joint project together. Um, and that friendship led to eventually the formation of a small practice called Team 4, which operated out of a bed sit in Hampstead. And um, the interesting thing here is it's not just the architects of that small practice. Uh, but the other individuals who have became very good friends, who are also the, uh, the engineers. And the first project of that practice was, um, was a kind of dug-in little gazebo uh, cockpit, as, um, as it's subsequently been, been called. And, um, and that related for, uh, for relatives of the, of the partners in Cornwall, uh, to uh, larger projects, well, a house that was, that was built, and another project unbuilt, which I'll show uh, in a moment. And uh, interestingly, uh, it has been uh, suggested that, that there is an affinity between the geometry of this cockpit, which is dug into the ground, and the, and the hardware of, of aeronautics. And I've not really touched on flight too much in this talk, although, again, it's a powerful influence. For many, many years, I would pilot uh, racing sailplanes, antique biplanes, small jets, fighter jets, um, helicopters, and, um, and, uh, and, and again, that's an inseparable thread that for me is a, as an influence. But coming back to those early days of Team 4, um, uh, an unbuilt project, one of several exploring high-density row housing, um, separating the car route, certainly informed by Shemaya's book, Community and, and Privacy, uh, which he co-authored with Christopher Alexander. I found myself at a very interesting turning point at the end of Yale because Sir Shemayev uh, tried to persuade me to join and follow an academic career. And again, that was, a, that was a crossroads. The other influence was Atelier 5 in Switzerland and their extraordinary compact housing, set high density housing, uh, set in a wooded uh, area just outside, outside Bern. Um, the unbuilt uh, project in Cornwall related to the cockpit. But one building that was built, which you can recognize with the kind of cross walls here, was a small house just outside London uh, called uh, Skybreak, which had blank cross walls, just like the a miniature version of the, of the larger scale housing. But if you see the plan, it's a deep plan, blank walls. You see the cross section, it's very much about top light. And, um, and if we see what that top light looks like, then that uh, in microcosm, is the subsequent deep plan, top lit contact with, with nature, with the elements um, at, a, at a vastly inflated scale. So again, uh, a high degree of, of continuity. Uh, coming back to the last project of Team 4, which was the Reliance Controls Factory, uh, which I mentioned, just to uh, perhaps suggest another important dimension uh, to that building. And in a way, the cut-through perspective section reveals the, um, how, how can I say, the uh, obsession with the different systems which are integrated and which are dissolved into the fabric. And, um, 
And there are overtones here, although it's so far removed in location and budget, with the Apple building. And, um, and this building marks that, uh, in a way, the architectural expression of uh, so-called cybernetics, Norbert Weiner, the idea that if you alter one system in the ecology, it will, it will affect another system, have a knock-on effect. And so that, that idea that, that you could make everything work more holistically. So the building services are, are integrated, dissolved into the fabric, the structure of the building. And this was an interesting departure point because uh, this building marked the parting of the ways between uh, Richard, myself, our fellow partners, my wife, Wendy, and uh, her sister, uh, Georgie, who gave us the legitimacy for, uh, for the beginning of the practice because she was the only registered architect, but she never actually was a part of the practice. But that's another, that's another story. Um, and, uh, and so the, the birth of, the, of Foster Associates, Wendy and myself, was also the birth of what is now called the Green Movement. Um, it was also, although we called ourselves Foster Associates, there were no associates, there were no projects. We sustained ourselves by teaching and various other things, but, but we, we were working together very close-knit with friends. Uh, our first partner, subsequent partner, an environmental engineer, Lauren Butt, uh, structural engineer, Tony Hunt, and a cost estimator, John Walker. And, and that was the integrated design approach which has developed over, again, the decades. At that time, uh, writers such as Rachel Carson in the early 1960s was drawing attention to the harmful effect of pest pesticides on ecosystems. And, um, and perhaps I think the, the, this green movement was triggered a number of influences. One was the Apollo space mission where Earthrise, seeing the uh, very, very thin, uh, fragile fragility of the planet, which was picked up by Buckminster Fuller. I was subsequently to, privileged to work with Bucky for the last 12 years uh, of his life. So this was, this was the, the birth of the new practice and the buildings, um, and perhaps sometimes the most important buildings are the unbuilt uh, buildings. And um, so we were very fortunate in terms of uh, having as a first client stroke patron who was uh, Fred Olson. Um, and we did a number of master planning projects for him. Uh, my wife held a surprise party for me, uh, took over a restaurant on my 80th birthday. I, I found myself sitting next to Fred Olson because she got a lot of people from the past together to celebrate my birthday. And Fred's remark was, if only we'd built these, these projects together at that time. Um, and I'll show you the one that we did build. But interestingly, they were all about recycling solar energy, converting seawater uh, to, to fresh water, converting uh, waste to fertilizer, wind power. And, um, and another project was bringing together some Olson um, headquarter companies together in a forest and buildings that touch the ground uh, lightly. And just looking at the, uh, those drawings from the, from the past, they were all about contact with nature, breathing buildings, fresh air, uh, sunlight, uh, recycling water, recycling uh, waste. And, um, and the one building that, that was built out of that uh, coming together with Fred Olson was this small uh, operations center, which uh, was technologically probably at the time the most advanced building. It, 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 it pioneered gasket technology, uh, the absolute minimalism, a deep plan that would be uh, saving energy. It had a materials like heat and light reflecting glass, the holistic approach, the what I would call a systems approach would take away 
the air at the light fittings to, uh, to eliminate the, the heat waste would recycle that into, into the ventilation system. And, uh, and socially, it was absolutely revolutionary because London Docks at that time was uh, probably the poorest um, uh, militant, uh, I mean, uh, very, very difficult to describe how, uh, how absolutely uh, awful the conditions in the docks were. And Olson's were pioneering a transformation, and I was very much a part of that. Uh, my role as, as, as architect was secondary to my role really as working with the trade unions and building up trust. And uh, the outcome was the first carpeted so-called landscaped offices, which at the, this period in the, uh, the turn between the 60s and 70s was truly revolutionary. And the idea that the, uh, the Dockers accommodation would be like a luxury sports club again was uh, unheard of. And that influenced our own working environment here, our first of many subsequent studios in Fitzroy Street, again with the carpet and the action office furniture of Robert Prost. So using ourselves as guinea pigs. And it's interesting that if I look at the ideal configuration that we developed there of individuals with their own drawing boards uh, clustered uh, as a group around a, a table. Um, if you substitute the drawing board for the screen, it's exactly what we were doing, some uh, have been, are doing now uh, in the Bloomberg headquarters. Uh, so many decades separate that, but the principles are the same. Um, in the absence of projects, we were working on research, uh, envisaging what the uh, what the school, the, the education center of the future would be. Um, we related this to a competition, uh, the Newport uh, School, uh, which we didn't win. It was influenced by the California SCSD uh, school system, which produced an extraordinary, elegant response to a consortium of individual companies, learning very much um, uh, the architect Ezra Ehrenkrantz uh, was immersed in the uh, post-World War II um, industrialization of schools here in the United Kingdom. And um, although that wasn't built, it did enable us to do something which was fairly revolutionary for IBM. IBM visited the Olson building like a number of people did, um, and, and it was through the visits to that building that we subsequently uh, received uh, commissions. And one was from IBM, who said, uh, we, we have a permanent headquarters down the road in Cosham, just south of London, and, um, and we'd like you to mastermind, master plan uh, some temporary buildings. And that's probably typical of what they had in mind. And, um, and through that way of working that I've described, where we simultaneously would work together, cost consultants, cost estimators, engineers, and so on, we demonstrated that within that budget, you could do a permanent building. Um, and this is the result here, which, um, uh, which is still around. It was a, called a temporary building, but of course, the division between temporary and permanent is very blurred. What was also revolutionary about that building is that for the first time it brought the computer, which at that period was immense and it needed a full access floor, which was hugely expensive. And, um, and we just plonked it in the middle of this very, very large uh, umbrella of a building. And, um, and that was an extraordinary radical move at the time. And um, I'll come to the flexibility of an access floor and the unaffordability of that in a, in, in a project shortly. Coming back to the Sainsbury Center and the idea of a building that would be a breathing building um, that would reduce the energy. And, um, and again, the, the ribbed panels, the way in which you can stiffen a thin panel of metal owes a lot to the influence of the Citroen, the Der Chevaux with its ribbed, um, corrugated uh, body. And, um, and also the helicopter was an influence again in that system's thinking. 
the idea that the components, different components, would be replaced over time. And that, as a principle, did uh, serve this building well. Uh, the, the gallery, the main gallery, and the influence of Sir Robert and Lady Sainsbury, uh, who were patrons of artists, they would recognize extraordinary talents. The Henry Moore, for example, they discovered Henry Moore when he was an art teacher in, in Bradford. So they had this incredible ability. I learned so much about art. I mean, our friends at that time had always been artists, young artists, but, uh, but they really opened my eyes. The, the, <coughs> I I've, I've could almost do a separate talk on the relationship between architecture and artists and the influence that, that they've had um, as, um, as inspirations. I'll give one tiny example here. Henry Moore, um, Robert, Sir Robert Sainsbury was chair of the trustees and he persuaded them to loan a reclining figure of Henry Moore outside the, uh, outside the building. And um, I'm there with Henry Moore and behind me here, we're moving around a plywood silhouette because you, uh, for citing a sculpture like that, it seemed, uh, how, 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 did you, how did you do it in, a, in an age pre-computer where you could do an instrument rendering? And, and even so, the physicality of the silhouette. And, um, and talking to Henry Moore and listening to him about the, the different ways in which colors interact with nature, how a dark color will dissolve into nature, and <clears throat> that has a, a, a direct effect on uh, on one project, and that's a sketch there about cables. And if you have a cable, uh, and the cable is, is in part seen against the landscape, in part seen against the sky, then depending on the color that you, the, the coloration that you give it, it will either disappear into the landscape, in which case it will be very, very powerful against the sky, or it will disappear, vice versa. And that was for me, instrumental in, later in decision-making on, uh, on one project, which was the Mio uh, Viaduct. And um, this, is, um, this is a kind of epic bridge that crosses a plateau from one side to the other. It was a competition, and our design is a series of columns which march across the landscape. It's really a river crossing, but philosophically we were saying that this is, is, is not about crossing a river, it's crossing a landscape, and it should touch the ground ever so lightly. It's on a 20, me, 20 kilometer radius, so you always have the reference points of the structure. And when you're on that bridge, because of the transparency of the sides, it's cl as close as you can get to, to flight, literally above the clouds. So that idea of touching the ground lightly uh, can be a building, it can be a piece of furniture. Here, uh, an inspirational, the lunar uh, lander, the uh, earlier technology of airships and the lightning uh, holes. And by the same token, uh, this, uh, the first airport uh, that, we, uh, that we did at, at, at Stansted, again, very much about uh, how it relates to the landscape. And, um, and the idea of the structural trees, uh, again, has its references uh, in nature. But perhaps to show the background to that building and what was typical at that time of an airport terminal is shown by this diagram here. So you would have a roof truss on top of the roof, you would have all this heavy equipment, and then you'd have a lot of ductwork underneath in the structure, very little natural light, lots of electric light, uh, a pretty grim thing to, to walk through and find your way if you're lucky, um, and not very good for maintenance either. So uh, the radical alternative was almost literally to turn that upside down, to open up the roof to nature, uh, free uh, light, energy, uh, contact with the changing of the, uh, of the weather, and to put all the heavy equipment below. And that was a, 
a transformational move and led to other iterations of that larger scale uh, here in Hong Kong, here in Beijing. Um, and um, I, I, I recently, last week, uh, we all came together as a practice. We had the partners coming from, um, from China, from North America, from Australia, all coming together. And, um, and I was sharing some thoughts on the creative uh, process. And, um, and one was the importance of listening. And, um, and the other was the importance of challenging. And, um, and perhaps through that process, one could reinvent a building. And perhaps there's a difference here between uh, a revolutionary move and an evolutionary move. So in terms of Stansted, uh, that was a revolutionary move because it changed the whole nature of, of, of terminals, not just terminals that we would do, but others. Um, and then the other airports that I've shown are not breaking new ground. They're building on that experience. So in that sense, they're evolutionary. And obviously, either way is, a, is an honorable uh, route. Uh, a building that reinvented the, uh, the nature of an office building was our Willis Faber project in Ipswich. Uh, the, uh, the move at the time, uh, which they described uh, off the record, as in a way moving the paper uh, factory out of the center of London and, um, and how in a market town that building might, um, uh, might uh, offer a new lifestyle as, as, as the workplace. And, um, and it, at its heart, it's very much a, a kind of atria with top light, with movement, and uh, for me, inseparable from the arcades, particularly on the right, the Lancaster Arcade. It was very much about, uh, about lifestyle. So it would have a swimming pool, you would move the escalators towards the light, the roof would be a landscaped roof, a garden in the sky. Uh, the inspiration was the Derry and Tom's roof garden, as well as the Atelier 5 work that I'd mentioned. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and in a way, anticipating the importance of the workplace post-COVID as a, 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 as a lifestyle, a place where people come together uh, and is desirable de uh, socially. The other aspect of this building is the, uh, at the time, it was born in the typewriter era over here, but because there was, inspired by that computer floor in the IBM building, a very low cost floor which would give you access every five feet, 1.5 meters for wiring, which enabled a seamless transition to the, um, to the digital age. And, um, and the building also pioneered glass technology, the glass skin, um, and the technical drawing that would make it possible, the uh, collaboration working with industry, working with Pilkingtons, the process of sketching and, and being on the site. And, um, and that is a reminder, this skin, that you can probably divide everything that, uh, that as a practice we have done over time into two categories. I didn't invent this, uh, this distinction. Uh, that falls to Luis Fernandez Galeano, who is the editor and founder of AV magazine. He curated the galleries in our foundation in Madrid. He named the galleries different. And Skin and Bones, one of them, because as he put it, you, the, your, your building is either uh, an exercise in the uh, detailing of the skin, the celebration of the skin, or the celebration of the structure, the bones behind that. And perhaps the ultimate uh, uh, skin is literally the fabric of an air-supported structure. Uh, its affinity with, uh, with zeppelins, uh, with airships, uh, that idea carried further in the Free University of, uh, of Berlin, uh, the library. Um, again, an almost airship-like uh, form in the courtyards of the, <coughs> of, the, of, of, of the building, which we renovated at the time. The synergy between the skin of our Center for the Performing Arts, the SAGE, uh, in Newcastle, 
and, um, and its uh, resonance with the uh, waterfall radiator of the airflow, a revolutionary car, the car that determined that the car we drive today, going back to 1934, um, uh, the skin of the, uh, of the St. Mary Axe, or Swiss Re, as it was originally known, um, Charles Jenks and others uh, relating it to vegetables, particularly the gherkin. The gherkin was introduced as a, uh, as a, as a word of derision um, and rather nicely has been adopted as uh, more affectionately, even by the architects. Um, and it's linked to Barnes-Wallace, the triangulated structures. Also, I would, I, I, I don't know, but I suspect an influence on, on, uh, on, on Bucky. And sometimes the expression of that structure internally with the smooth external uh, skin, Mexico airport, tragically, um, well, its affinities to the DC-3, again, the smooth skin aerodynamic of an airliner, uh, this case in the 30s, um, a project that for political reasons was halted uh, three quarters the way through its construction and unbelievably cost more to uh, dismantle than it did to, than it would have done to, to finish it. And Mexico City still has no operating airport. Influences can range beyond, I talked about the importance of unbuilt projects. This was a project, a research project called Climatropics, which um, uh, was uh, the idea of communing with nature, dissolving the workplace under an ultra-thin uh, membrane uh, structure. And that found reality in the Amazon headquarters in, in Seattle. It was quite widely published. So it's really very nice sometimes when your unbuilt projects get built by somebody else. Um, <laughs> uh, <coughs> talk about work with Bucky the solar house, the autonomous house, with its shade that would move around and the outer skin. Um, uh, as Bucky saw it, it would rest on oil, you're frictionless, and these would, would spin, you could close it. And um, when I did this sketch of the Reichstag dome, I most certainly was not thinking of Bucky and the autonomous house. But of course, looking back, it comes back to that subconscious or conscious um, relationship to uh, those memories which might be dormant. The, um, that cupola, um, a symbol of democracy in action, the spiraling ramp, welcoming the public, the public who uh, are symbolically above the politicians, who are answerable to them, uh, an extraordinary manifestation of democracy translated almost literally into, into architecture because it's the politicians who, uh, who control uh, that, notwithstanding the fact that we might rewrite the brief to produce a building which is uh, still an energy manifesto. It's virtually a zero carbon building using deep aquifers, solar panels, vegetable oil, co-generators. And that ramp uh, resonates uh, again in the headquarters the idea that pedestrian movement, light, the movement of air, a breathing building. Uh, and that headquarters, uh, influenced by history, the history of Watling Street, the oldest Roman road, its intersection in the historic uh, city of London, and the way that that would uh, determine the prime uh, route uh, through it. Um, you saw in which the, the way in which the pantry focused on St. Paul's, another project where St. Paul's is very much one of the protagonists, and that is the, uh, the Millennium Bridge. And the Millennium Bridge reinvented the idea of a suspension bridge because it's essentially very, very low. So it's the absolute minimum intervention across the Thames. I described it in a competition sketch here as the blade of light. And it was only afterwards that I realized that as a kid, I would go to the Saturday morning uh, films at my local cinema, and there was Flash Gordon and the blade of light where he would throw a switch and people would walk across this blade of light and escape Mungo the, well, but that's another story. Anyway. Uh, and um, 
Coming back to Manchester here, our small Maggie's uh, center, and, um, and many have remarked on the uh, aeronautical similarities. And interestingly, the, uh, the view from the, uh, the greenhouse structure is remarkably evocative of the view from uh, some of the uh, early, uh, early aircraft. One of the significant changes from then from then is the way in which the streamline era has given way to a much more planar geometry, which is a stealth uh, geometry. And I've been fascinated by that. And I think that geometry resonates in the prow view of the Maggie Center that I, I, I just showed. And it became the inspiration for, again, an unfinished project where I was invited by La Scala uh, to prepare the opera for Othello, and I used the architecture of, of war in terms of the stealth geometry of the Lockheed boat and the, uh, and the, and, and the bomber. And um, that association with, uh, with the architecture and the lunar space program, again, the magazine, Luis Fernandez Galeano, his drawing parallels between our communication tower in Barcelona and the, and the hardware of, uh, of space. And um, this brings us really to uh, the last uh, project, which is the Apple headquarters pushing the, uh, the glass technology uh, absolutely to its limits. Um, and, um, and the way in which this building encourages the flow of fresh air, that first breathing building I talked about in, uh, in the Sainsbury Center. And, and that uh, developed now to much more sophisticated degree. And uh, perhaps the big difference between now and then in the early days is that we felt intuitively and passionately that sunlight, a good view, fresh air, all those things would be good for you. But we couldn't prove it. Since then, the Harvard School of Public Health, led by an individual, very close colleague, Joe Allen, have done scientifically proven uh, that it does actually make you perform better. It does, it, it's good for your health. And, uh, and of course, we now know uh, in the hospital work that we do that patients who have a view from their room after surgery recover faster than those uh, without a view. So, uh, so good architecture is good for your health. Um, and, um, and finally, this, uh, this, the, it, it looks almost like the circular main building is kind of one line or an instant. It took, it took nine months of going through innumerable, I don't know how many variations, each was given their nickname. There was the propeller scheme. There were all um, geometries that would uh, form the edge of the site. And finally, Steve Jobs' idea of the pod and the geometry of a pod, which was a team space with, uh, with programming cells either side of it, was finally resolved by the circle. And interestingly, that circular geometry is picked up in the, uh, in the Steve Jobs theater either, either, either side there. And literally, that roof is held aloft by structural glass. There is no structure. That vast roof is, is literally suspended in space. There was no intent for any science fiction links, but interestingly, every press commentary at the time of its construction, its emergence, its launch, was picked up. Mothership has finally landed, taking off. Um, and it is interesting. There is analogies with the uh, 1970s Stanford uh, and NASA project, uh, the kites of the, of the 19th century. And, um, and just finishing on the project that was referred to earlier, our uh, work with the European Square as it was then. And it's interestingly, that took seven years. Um, the pandemic, in my view, has not changed anything. It's accelerated trends that were already there. The one thing possibly which has changed is public opinion, because if you then went around London, roads had been taken over by outdoor cafes, terraces, and, um, and that has uh, that's made a, a lasting impression. So I think, 
I, I think the result of the pandemic is there is much greater appreciation of the outdoors and, uh, and nature. We've just got one last question. Hi, sir. Um, I really admire the way you manifest your thoughts in reality. Um, now, I'm a graduating architecture student. My name is Gleb. And I thought um, you really know how to, once again, uh, turn things upside down and create something really unbelievable. So I was going to ask, um, following your advice of potentially being bold, okay? If I was to ask you for a job, sir, <laughs> 600 people. <laughs> what would you say? <laughs> would you like me to end? <laughs> I'd, I'd welcome you with open arms. All you have to do is do like everybody else who... Uh, <laughs> and that's just convince my colleagues, because I don't interview anymore. I rely on, on, on my colleagues. So... Uh, also, be on the lookout um, and, for and, the and I, 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 I seriously encourage you to, uh, to apply. Um, Thank you very much, sir. I will. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for that last question. Um, uh, so, uh, so um, thank you again to Colette and to Stephen for their introductions. Um, I just want to say thanks to the staff who were very patient going through all the Eventbrite tickets because um, there was a bit of a forgery, uh, fraud ticket thing going on as well. Um, particular thanks to the MSA evening teams, to Metro, and particularly to to Rachel for her organization. I, I know it was quite, quite stressful, so. Um, but of course, uh, most of all, thank you to Lord Foster for coming to speak to us, giving up your valuable time. And probably somewhat disappointingly, it sounds like for the first time, complying with the brief uh, and actually being inspirational. So thank you very much. <laughs> Free to leave. A couple more autographs, I imagine. We're not going to be able to do them all.